they can be good. Culture is good and can be bad if the culture is bad, right? And so the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions is that they used to compete. They used to vie in race and completing good deeds. This is really amazing to me, right? How that type of, that culture can actually take place in a household, right? I'm the child and I'm waking the parent up for function. Inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with that in our households, right? When the mother is coming home and the child is looking out the window and he sees the mother with bags, right? And struggling, right? And not with the, the perfect smile on the face, right? He jumps off from the phone or from the device and he rushes out the door and he initiates, right? Because racing means that you're ready. Right? You're aware, you're looking for that opportunity to do good, right? And this is something that they're all on the same page about, right? But this is something that obviously would take some, some work to actually establish in our households. And then the second thing, and they used to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in hope and also in fear. And first and foremost, to me, this means that there's a line of communication with each and every one of them that's going to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And sometimes people think calling on Allah in hope and in fear means that because you hope in Allah and because you fear Allah, and that is a part of the meaning, right? But it also means that your worldly hopes and your worldly concerns, your fears, you're also taking those to Allah, right? And you're expressing your worldly hopes. I wanna be a doctor, I wanna be a lawyer. A lot of these kids, they wanna be basketball players now, right? Mm -hmm. They're taking their concerns, they're talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And sometimes we don't redirect our youth to establish that type of relationship with Allah. It's all about uh, praying. It's all about reading Quran. But what about just like sitting down and really just talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is there anything wrong with that? Right? And Zakari alayhi salam, we see this in him that he was concerned. Right? This isn't his fear of Allah. This is he's expressing his fear for who's going to be in charge after him. This is a worldly fear. Right, and it's also a worldly hope because he's about to ask for a, a son in Yahya alayhi salam. Right, likewise, the mother of Maryam, uh, Hannah, right, she seeks refuge with Allah on behalf of Maryam and Isa alayhi salam. Right, this is not her fear of Allah, her concern for her for Allah, but this is her concern for her offspring. Right, so these are worldly concerns, right? And always actions speak louder than words, right? There's a reason why we see Yahya alayhi salam, as we'll talk about following in the footsteps of his father, Zechariah. And we see Maryam alayhi salam following in the footsteps of her mother, right? Because they paid that way through example. And these are the seeds that are planted so early on that they will, you know, rarely ever be uprooted, right? The earliest. Uh, memories of the child, they are so deeply impressed in the psyche that it's just hard to break free from those, right? One example of, uh, and then the last the last part of the verse was, uh, and they had this reverence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, sometimes in, in some cultures, uh, people swear casually. Allah. Wallahi, every other word, right? And this is actually diminishing the ta'zim, you know, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by just casually swearing by Allah, using the, the, the name of Allah in vain, right? And this happens so often, um, especially in Eastern cultures, right? Why are you using the name of Allah? <laughs> and, you know, 
regarding a basketball game. It's not, it's trivial, right? Now, when it comes down to, you know, justice and truth in these matters, this is when we implement the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? But being casual, right? This would actually reduce the level of reverence in a person subconsciously, right? Why aren't you respecting the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it is mentioned, right? Why don't you feel humility when the name of Allah, because we have these things in our culture that undermine that development of, of uh, reverence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the example of Yahya that I wanted to mention, like father, like son, and to show how uh, deeply impacted he was by his father, is that one time Yahya alayhi salam, he was uh, missing for three days. Can you imagine? <laughs> right? And Zechariah is looking left and right, you know, everywhere for Yahya alayhi salam. What's happened to my son, right? And you can imagine he's beginning to worry until he finds him uh, inside of a, a hole in the ground. It's like a grave that he dug for himself. And he finds him weeping, and this is obviously a very extreme example, right? <laughs> um, and they have the type of virtue and the type of mindset that would be so just, you know, strange. It seems mythological, you know, in our times, like how a person could actually reach that level. But this is the reality, and this is what we have in our tradition. So Yahya is inside of this grave, and he's weeping. And Zechariah is baffled. He's like, my son. You know, I've been looking for you for three days, and here I find you inside of this hole that you have dug for yourself, and you're weeping. And he said, oh, my father, did you not say, right, these seeds that he planted, did you not say that between paradise and hellfire is a bridge or, or a path that can only be crossed by the tears of those who weep? Right, so he was deeply impacted by that seed that was planted by Zechariah. Zechariah is not even thinking that he's going to interpret it in that way. Right, what did Zechariah do at that moment? He said, weep on. Okay, then go ahead and finish your crying. And he got down inside with him and he cried with him as well. Right, he was, you said, right, they're competing in being first, right, in terms of righteousness, right? And they're going on this journey together. And this would naturally encourage others to do uh, more good. And likewise, we find in Maryam, so now we want to keep the balance. This is why I love um, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved their narrative in the Quran, right? She has mention of the very same qualities of her mother, right? So we already mentioned that before they were born, she seeks refuge with Allah on behalf of Maryam and her offspring, right? What happens when Jibril alayhi salam, I'm going into my sukkah now, but um, what happens when Jibril alayhi salam appears before Maryam? Qalad inni a'udhu bir rahman, right? The very same quality of seeking refuge with Allah that was in her mother, now we see that same quality in Maryam. Instinctively, she sought refuge with Allah, right? Because that's what she knows from her mother, right? And so these characteristics, they are inherited, right? Subconsciously, subliminally. You don't think your kids are watching. They're watching, <laughs> even when they're not, right? There's, there's functions of the brain that they're not conscious of, it's absorbing that information. And then when he tells Jibril, they said, tells her that she's going to have a uh, child, she says, uh, how am I going to have a child? No man has ever touched me. And I was never unchaste, right? And then when she comes to her people carrying the child, what do they say? Your father? Right, and your mother, nor was she unchaste, right? So she's inheriting the qualities 
directly from her mother, All right? And this is something that we all need to uh, be aware of, you know, that we think sometimes they're not paying attention or, you know, out of frustration, uh, anger, haste, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, right? We're rushing so much, and I, I'm learning this for myself now, right? That we could be actually transferring anxiety, right, into our children. And when they face those same situations later on in life, guess how they're going to respond? What's their reference point? This is how you deal with that situation, right? And so we're uh, their first teachers and their first mentors. Um, I don't want to go too long. Creating a virtuous household. So one of the most important things, and we find this in actually another chapter in the Quran, Surah Luqman, is coupling conviction with character. Conviction building and character building at the very same time, right? Why do I have to clean up my room? Because I said so. Right? This sounds familiar to you guys? <laughs> right? Why do I have to do that? Right? Because respect your parents, right? And um, what's interesting about the advice of Luqman is that every time he gives his son an advice, he connects it back to Allah. It's never because I said so. Right? But this is not pleasing to Allah. Right? And Allah doesn't like this type of person, right? And be, you know, whatever you do, know that Allah is going to, you know, if it's in, in the heavens or in the earth or inside of a rock, Allah is going to bring it out, right? He's always, his character building is connected to the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's an interesting phenomenon. I'm a, a Quran head, right? So Quran is my field of studies. Um, but the first verse is Luqman advising his son about the rights of Allah, right? And it's in the first person, Ya Bunay. La tushrik illah. This is Luqman talking to his son about the rights of Allah. But then the next verse switches. Wa wasayna al-insana biwalidayhi, right? Then it's Allah advising the son about the rights of the parents, All right? So the pronoun shifts, right? Why is the pronoun shifting now, right? Because it's not the parent saying that I have rights over you, but it's Allah saying that your parents have rights. So sometimes we have to redirect it and connect it back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? One of the things that I see a lot in youth today is that they do not interpret the things that happen to them in life according to Quran and Sunnah. Many times they'll interpret the things that happen to them according to uh, this movie or that song or this book, right? But they won't be able to make the connections back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And then of course, establishing a culture of virtue in the household, we also have to establish that reference point. Asking our children how they interpret different things that happen to them. This is us checking in. How, you know, how do you make sense of that, right? Ma asaba, for example, ma asaba min musibatin fil ardi wa la fi anfusikum illa fi kitabin min qabli an nabra'aha. Right. How do they interpret calamity? Would they be able to reach back and understand it in the light of the Quran? Allah says that no calamity befalls in the earth or in yourself, except that we have, you know, it's in a book before it even comes to be, right? So that you would not uh, despair over the things uh, that you missed, right? And that you would not be overjoyed about those things that have reached you because this is the middle path, right? And our hearts are connected to Allah more so than the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what he keeps from us 
and what he extends to us, right? One time I was explaining to my son, we were living in Egypt and he wanted to know some of the meanings of what he's learning of the Quran. And he was learning in um, the <laughs> Why is this funny? <laughs> Something happened recently? Oh, mashallah. Right, these are very, very strong, potent, beautiful verses, mashallah. And so I'm explaining to him the meaning of these verses, right? That the insan is, you know, unstable in a sense, right? The thing that actually anchors him is his prayer. The thing that actually anchors him is his iman, right? That's why it comes back to... Uh, Illa, illa musallin, right? Except for those who pray. But anyway, unstable, when when something evil touches him, then he becomes like bothered and annoyed and you know unsettled and disturbed, right? And then when something good touches him, uh, he becomes clinging on to it, covetous, right? And I thought nothing of it. You know, he continued to do his memorization and review until like my daughter hit her head, right? His younger sister hit her head that day or the next day. And then all of a sudden, as she's crying, he said, he just started reciting out of nowhere. He's just started reciting, right? Somewhere and he's still playing while he's doing this, right? And it was like, is that a coincidence, right? Or is something working in his subconscious mind right now that's making the connection between that verse that he learned, right? And the meaning of it and what's happening right now, right? And so actually the next week, something similar happened again, right? And I was like, oh, subhanAllah, right? And that really opened my eyes to establishing that reference point and then also checking in, how are you interpreting these things, right? Yeah, the sons of Yaqub, because youth, they don't interpret things the way that we interpret things. And that's why we have a hard time sometimes getting through to them, because they see it entirely different. You look at the interpretation of the sons of Yaqub, our father is preferring Yusuf over us. Our father is the one being unfair. That's their interpretation of the situation. And that's what they use as a justification for the action that they were going to do after. Right. And so sometimes we put up that wall of communication because we think or we have assumed that they should be seeing things exactly as we see them. Right. And this is. Most of the most of the time, not the case, especially in our society today. How much time? Two minutes, five minutes? I don't want to extend it. No, that's too long because I want them to ask questions, inshallah. Providing space to develop tawakku, right? Trust and reliance in Allah, which in worldly terms would translate into independence, being able to walk and move on your own with confidence, right? Sometimes we spoil our children and we have that inclination as parents that we want to take care of them to the best of our ability, but sometimes we take care of them so well that we never actually give them that space to develop Reliance on Allah. All they know is reliance on mama and baba. Because anytime they need something, they come to mama, they come to baba, right? They put on the nice character, <laughs> best character, right? And I need this and I need that, right? Sometimes, and it's not a matter of being harsh or hard on them. Maybe this is something that you want to prepare in the future. Have those conversations now. Hey, look, once you get 16, I want you to start volunteering here, right? Every single week. Or I want you to 
start a start a job, start a start a, a, a small business for yourself, right? And start saving up, right? And set some parameters that this is what I'll be taking care of for you, right? But this is what I want you to take care of for yourself, right? When I tell kids that I started my first business at seven years old, <laughs> right? They're like, you know, they can't even fathom that, right? I was a younger brother, so I was chasing behind my older brothers, but that was my first uh, experience trying to earn and save money, you know, for myself, right? So we have to give them the space and we can't always be the crutch that they lean on, right? But again, turning that attention to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because we don't want them to come to the age of independence and they don't know how to walk on their, their own. And they're struggling. They, they go away for college or, you know, whatever it is, you know, even when they get married, right? Because we never gave them that space to develop that, that natural quality that they would need, obviously, to survive, um, throughout the course of their lives, right? And the last two things that I'll mention is understanding the home dynamic, right? So um, when I was in Egypt, my, my brother, closest in age, he sent his son, Mikael, stay with me for three weeks. And it was a tarbiya trip for him. And he's also a basketball player, so we trained in the evenings. And... Um, According to my brother, he came back as a transformed person with an entirely different like mindset. And he said, like, what did you do? <laughs> and um, we had the conversation. He says, yeah, that's what I've been saying. Right. And that's what I've been doing. Right. And what's actually happening is a lot of youth they shut out their parents. And a part of the reason, not the entire reason is, right, is that information and instruction is coming from one direction. So like who tells them to do their homework? Who tells them to clean their room? Who tells them to pray their salah? So all of these are different things, but the instruction is coming from one direction. So now you're always on my back, right? And they begin to figure out a coping. How do I cope with that? I'm not going to let it bother me. I'm going to block it out, right? And so this is just something that we have to be aware of. And this is also the importance of identifying mentors and other people to communicate that same message, right? That you're communicating, but coming from a different direction, right? And so also it's important to lower the guard, right? So as a husband, uh, one of the worst things I would say would be to come home from a long day of work or whatever I'm coming home from, right? Travel, et cetera, and to be met with instruction or to be met with complaints, right? Why didn't you clean your room? Or the trash needs to go out, right? It would be more appropriate to lower the guards and to check in on the person before reminding them or asking them, you know, when are you going to do this or reminding them that this needs to be done but actually just how was your day at school today what's going on how are you know just checking in on the person having a candid conversation and then once they've settled and you've connected in that way they will be way more receptive than now you know your, your room still hasn't been cleaned you know or the dishes it's your turn to do the dishes etc these type of things right so just be mindful of that in youth because you don't want, you never want to block that channel of communication. It's one of the worst things that can happen between parent and child, right? And lastly, devices. <laughs> when we talk about establishing a virtuous culture in the household, right? 
And there's a there's a um, a triangle actually. So you have the masjid, you have the house, and you have the school, right? And these things should all be congruent. They should all be working together to produce virtue. You find that in the household of Zechariah, the first place that benefited from their virtue, the household virtue, was the masjid, right? Trickled out into the society, right? And as long as that triangle is in place, at least historically, we, we would have been safe. But now we have the devices, right? There's another factor that's able to intervene in that process, come inside of our homes, come inside of our schools, come inside of our massage, right? Just recently, I got a call from uh, a brother. His son is 12 years old. He goes to Islamic school. He's memorizing Quran. He's very polite, right? He'll shake your hand if he sees me. Obviously, I'm the youth, the youth director. He never walks past me without speaking to me. Very, very, you know, uh, great, excellent akhlaq, character and behavior outwardly, right? But recently, he was under the influence of some of his peers, and he began chatting on one of these chats that they have that they're supposed to do homework on <laughs> with a Muslim of a Muslim female of like age who also goes to Islamic school, right? And he's the most unsuspecting person. Trust me, like if you saw this kid, you'd be like, no, not him. Like there's no way, right? But these things are happening. And we shouldn't be naive to think that they can't happen, right? And the device, we have to figure out a way to manage it, right? And to monitor. They have these phones now. You don't have to have phones. They have phones that have a limit of five apps, like GPS, uh, texting, like just like the bare minimum necessities. They don't need access to YouTube on their phone. They don't need access to social media on their phone, right? And I was mentioning to the youth uh, yesterday, the amount of images and visuals and things that they're seeing, these things are impacting their hearts. Like, you know how they overhear you? And they don't even remember that you said that, but it has impacted their psychology. What about these millions of images that are they're flipping through and seeing online, right? They're impacting their hearts, right? And it's gathering and it's building up and it's snowballing until one day it's actually gonna show up in their actions. It's not too late then, but that's oftentimes when I'm getting the phone. Can you talk to my son? Can you talk to my daughter, right? And those are also the things that are going to turn them against you. You're fighting them for the phone now, right? They're preferring the phone over you. They're not even listening to you. They can't wait to get back to the phone. And that's severing that connection in the household, right? Whereas if they didn't have these things, they would have to figure out different ways to find that fulfillment that they're looking for. Right. So I'll stop there, inshallah. There's obviously so much that can be said, but I don't want to overextend. Jazakallah khayyam, brother. Um, I think these are beautiful gems from the Quran, different insights. Uh, may Allah grant us that virtuous household. So in order to have the likes of Yahya and the likes of Maryam, you have to have the likes of Anna and Zakaria yeah. and uh, uh, always racing to do good and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, tying into uh, also Brother Ibrahim, I don't know if you guys heard, uh, talking to the youth about choice yes. and making decisions and how can one decision impact your life forever, not only in this world, but in the next as well. And there was a great talk tying into to that as well. So inshallah, I'll open the floor for questions. And I'm so happy that we have a lot of fathers here too. So it's balanced. He kind of like, he gave something to Michelle. <laughs> you know, I knew it was only going to be sisters here <laughs> in my heart. It was a balanced talk. So it's, you know, some things in that. Um, and also it's very important that we connect and check in. 
with our uh, with our children and lower the guard. No, so no. always reference the Quran and Sunnah in their lives. Why we doing what we do? So inshallah, uh, if you have questions, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, to ask inshallah. I think it's very informative. It's very clear clear uh, to everybody. The message is very clear and and uh, reaches very easily to uh, to our parents. Uh, so any questions do we have? There's not going to be any questions. See what I'm saying? It's uh, you make it in a way that you no. will be no follow up. <laughs> but subhanAllah, when we first talked, we said it'll be a 20 minute talk because that's the attention span. But what I noticed that you were hungry for more. And uh, mashallah, that's, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, bless your family. Uh, we had the pleasure to uh, meet your father as well. And he uh, did one of our therapy program last year. My father? Yes. <laughs> My brother. Your father, my father, yes. Oh my God! Uh, my so, father likes that, man. <laughs> <laughs> the whole family, you see, the father, brother, you see, dad, brother, and dad. And Allah bless you for your contribution. Yeah. Uh, for the great, uh, the things that you do, uh, especially with our. I'm doing something. Uh, okay, so uh, with that, inshallah, we will have uh, November fourth. I think Sister Isdar has something for the parents for uh, like reading workshop. Inshallah. And uh, also, we have in, at the Bia program uh, on Zoom, we call it Mission. Uh, this is to address the LGBT uh, issue. Uh, inshallah. So many other events coming your way. And inshallah, also, uh, I believe November 11th, uh, we have the exhibit. What is this, Amen? 18. 18. November 18th is the exhibit, inshallah. But November 12th, I think we have the uh, carnival, the fall festival. So many things happening here at School of And the banquet on uh, <laughs> December 3rd, right? December 3rd is our bank, inshallah. So, uh, you know, the school works so hard to make sure to bring all these activities and all these uh, things for parents and youth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all that. Uh, okay, so we'll go ahead and, uh, Sister Amanda, would you like to add anything, inshallah? Yeah. Sure. Let's keep you guys on the line. I have a question. Oh, man. It's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody has to go to work. <laughs> so, how can we acknowledge the uh, issue with? The surroundings of our students right now. Um, how much influence the outside world have on them, whether it's their friends or the things that they're watching? And how can we, as parents, try to limit some of these um, influences or the negative ones that we uh, from them? Sometimes there's so much pushback. We can't. We can't Keep them away from their devices, for example, or keep them away from certain friends. How do we approach that? Uh, let me just for the people. Oh, let me try that. Uh, so the question was, how uh, much can parents do uh, taking into consideration the exposure our uh, our children have uh, to social media uh, and the culture of that social media? How much can we do to limit, uh, you know, uh, the, the danger and the damage that can cause to our to our youth? Um, I think the question was two parts, right? So the first part was how impactful is the culture, is the society? And then the second was what can we actually uh, do to offset um, those influences? And uh, I won't give an absolute answer. I don't think there's uh, an absolute answer um, because everybody's situation is, is unique. Um, <clears throat> One of my principles in youth development is no one cares what you think until they first think that you care. And so uh, compassion and mercy is always at the foundation of my dealings with, with my youth and also with my, my own children. Because the more you know they know that you're concerned about them, the more worried they are um, and dis and disrupting that, right, or being a cause of uh, distress and, and worry and these type of things, right? Um, in terms of the societal influence, so the greater culture is always going to be uh, influential. There's very, I don't want to say there's very little that you can do, right? So there's this idea of relevance. All right, so in an Islamic environment, what is relevant is learning Quran, 
you know, the remembrance of Allah, you climb the social ladder in a sense in that space based on what is relevant in that space. But now they're stuck between two paradigms, right? Because when they're in this space, once you extract them from this space and they go out into what we call the real world, which we're preparing them for, which has the greater influence, learning Quran isn't that relevant. The remembrance of Allah isn't that relevant. And as a young person who, whose identity isn't really that strong, perhaps, and they don't have the ability to just say, hey, I'm a Muslim, this is my principle, this is what I'm about, and they haven't gotten to that level, oftentimes they're going to sacrifice in order to become relevant in, in whatever space that is. That's a natural phenomenon, it happens, it's not just limited to the Muslim community, right? And one way to offset that is actually having them see the value in Islam, right? So I don't teach Islam, I don't teach Iman, I teach Ihsan. Because Ihsan, with Ihsan, you're always going to be relevant, right? Yusuf is in prison, not a Sanat. He's still relevant. Why? Because he has that characteristic of Ihsan. He's a leader, right? He's a standout person, right, because of his akhlaq, right? And oftentimes, people don't know how to have relevant Islam, right? Be Muslim and relevant at the same time, and so they sacrifice. But if you teach them to be people of ihsan, then this is one way to offset their internal inclination to give up, right? Um, and Allah Ta'ala, he knows best. The second part was protect them from all of that. Not only make sure that the, the pushback that we have, from, you know, the people so, that they hang out with, right? The, the, what they watch and what they hear. What they hear. Um, do I? Lots of do I, right? Um, <laughs> And it and it and it does work ultimately. I, I want to say I am definitely the result of parental dua. Um not a single kid in this entire school, I would believe, was uh, as hard-headed as I was, as stubborn as I was as a young person, right? So never despair of parental dua. Right? I never would attribute any of my success to myself because I know that I don't deserve it, but I know that there were people really making sincere dua in the last third of the night and, you know, begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for my, my personal um, salvation. And one of the greatest downfalls in my life is that I was never kept busy enough doing good, which means that I had free time to do otherwise. Well, all three in them in San Right? Try to involve them and keep them busy as much as possible where they actually lose that dependency. They have three hours of device time. They can be volunteering. They can be developing a life skill that's going to actually add value to their lives and make it easy for them, whether they know it or not, to, to get married and to get a job. And all of those things are going to contribute to their success. Right. So oftentimes they don't think we're adding value to them, to their experience, to their life. Right. So figure out ways for them to actually see that value and to embrace that value by keeping them busy as much as possible. Inshallah. And I know that's very, very small, but uh, inshallah, it'll go a long way. That was a great question. Uh, so, dua is, uh, I'm sure everybody here in this room makes dua for their kids. They continue to make dua. Right, so, that again, just going to take him back to what Brother Brim said that it was just not fear of Allah, but concern for their kids, concern for a generation to come. And I think also one good thing that you talked about yesterday is that you know, through that natural fitna, mm. that you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala found us on good to choose that which is all good to do, which is right. So teaching them, you know, right from bad, good from evil. That's something you know comes with 
not only doing it right, but doing it with Ihsa and doing it in the best way to stand, not only for themselves, but for others, inshallah. Uh, all right, we'd like to for that beautiful uh, prayer session. I would love to have you more, inshallah. So, we we'll let right. our parents know. Uh, we we'll conclude with the dua, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma Inshallah, don't forget if you're here, it's time to uh Brother Ibrahim will be giving them a slide as well, inshallah. So I'm looking forward to that as well, inshallah. Zakullah Khairan, and if you'd like to have some more. Professional, I know we are. It's like, oh.